Ravi Shankar, you're only doing one concert in London this year, but in fact you're still traveling tremendously, aren't you? How much time do you actually spend traveling year by year these days? Well, I travel quite a bit, uh, but uh, I'm planning to travel much less and spend more time in India. In fact, uh, I'm settled in Delhi now. When I say settle, I've just started. How do you find audiences now in the West? Are they much more knowledgeable than they used to be? Definitely. Now it is no more the fad. That period is finished, you know. Uh, Mid-60s to beginning of 70, there was that sitar explosion, if you remember. Uh, it was good in a way because it brought a lot of young people all around the world to our music. But uh, because it was like a fashion or superficial, gradually it died down. But those who remained are still there. And I am very happy to say that today we have the best audience, much more understanding, appreciative and respectful. Who is your audience then now? Is it still mainly young people? No, it is a mix, mixed group now. But a lot of young people are still there. But their attitude is, as I said, much more respectful and understanding. Do you read an <coughs> audience when you start playing? Can you sense that an audience is with you? Because you could play for many hours, couldn't you? And you had to um, make your ragas much, much more compact in, in uh, previous years. Can you be more, more relaxed now and let them last a little longer for Western audiences now? Well, you know, the word vibration, that, that is something which uh, an artist can immediately sense. And we feel that very strongly. Mm -hmm. Some places uh, one feels much more inspired because there's much more, you know, rapport. <coughs> In our country, of course, it is uh, much easier because there are more people who understand and there's a constant rapport between the audience and the uh, musician. And in fact, the listeners also participate, like, you know, saying, wah, wah, bahut achhe, kya kane, ah, ha, ha. You know, things like that they softly say, which is saying like bravo, wonderful. So it is easier to be inspired in our country. But here you see the system is uh, very different naturally because concert going uh, discipline is much, much, much more older here. So people sit down quietly, but it doesn't matter. We feel immediately. If you have brought Indian classical music to the West. But I wonder if, because of your success all over the world, whether you've helped to keep Indian, cla Indian classical music of importance in India itself, because they're all the influences of the West. The um, electronic sitar exists, doesn't it, in this type of thing, and Western music is gradually spreading all over the world. Um, do you find that through your work that the, uh, the sitar and Indian well, classical music is still I important? had I been uh, 15, 20 years younger, mm. maybe... I would have been influenced in some way or the other or gone along with the, you know, this whole thing that came in the 60s, I tell you. I, bec I became a cult guru and I was a pop, almost like a pop star. But being matured and very much steeped down in our music and culture, I wasn't swept, you know. And I have not been influenced ever by any outside influence, in musically that is. One thing is very much misunderstood in some way, it has been misunderstood, that in the beginning, when I say beginning, in the earlier stages, I, st I used to play some of the numbers a little shorter in duration and try to give more in number then just play one long raga and finish and have an interval and uh, another. In the beginning I used to play maybe two ragas in the first part and another two ragas in the second part. And many people sort of criticized, they thought I'm trying to, you know, compromise, but that's not true. A raga, as I hope you know what a raga is, it's very hard to explain a raga really because it's not just a melody or a key or a scale, it's something all together, but something very special from India.
It's a melody form. That's the easiest way we can say, which has its own ascending and descending structure. It, is, it has its own personality. And what is very important that uh, each of these ragas are associated with morning, afternoon, evening, night, etc. But there's no hard and fast rule about the duration. It's not a composition in the Western sense, you know. It, there's no five-minute raga or ten-minute raga or one-hour raga. One can play as long as one wants, depending on the listeners, you know, the atmosphere and the inspiration. Or one can p play in a shorter period. And that's why our great masters, some of the immortal records we have, you know, starting from three and a half minute records to 15 minutes or 20 minutes, how could they do it if that was the case? So yeah. that is the only thing I did, you know, as, as far as in the beginning. But nowadays I don't do even that. I play, you know, the almost like I do in India. You were saying that you want to spend more time at home. But how do you divide your life now between teaching and composing and performing? Well, I try to make it as proportionate as I can. I'm working very hard nowadays with uh, about five students I have, and they are very young. They range from the group of 16 years to about 20, 25. And I'm working hard with these five very talented uh, students that I think they have got a tremendous future. You see, I started having schools. I had school in Bombay, I had school in Los Angeles, but then I gave up. I, I knew that I cannot run a school because to run a school one has to be there, put, you know, there. Everybody wants that Ravi Shankar should be there. And that I couldn't do with my concertizing and performing. Therefore, I believe in really creating just a few very good students, you know, in the old Indian style, as we did. This is an oral tradition, as you know. It's not a written down music. So you have to give a lot of time and concentration to create a good student. When it comes to performing, do you still enjoy yeah, performing I perform. and touring the world? Right. I perform a lot in India also. And then, uh, you see, I'm trying to make make it uh, in a way so that I'm uh, almost seven, eight months in India. And the rest of three, four months, uh, I just travel outside. Well, I, I know certainly your teaching is very important to you, but I hope in the future you won't forget the rest of us, and that you will still find time to visit London from time to time. Ravi Shankar, thank you very much. Thank you. He's waiting just behind you. Would you like to, to show us just what a, a sitar looks like in a little bit uh, of detail? Because it's a magnificent uh, instrument. I'll try to it? show you and just uh, explain about it, but the seat is so uncomfortable. I you should be actually sit sitting in the inside, shouldn't you? Right. Yes. But still, I'll it's try made it. out of teak wood. It's beautifully carved Completely as well, isn't hollow it? inside. Yes. And this part is a gourd. This very fragile. You see, I don't believe in putting it in a box. I travel with it in a just ordinary case, and I buy a ticket for it. It travels always next to me. Oh, yes, with its on own seatbelt on on the plane. Yes, of course, <laughs> without seat. Yes. And you see, these are all very delicate, beautiful work. You see, another piece of gold here with an opening, you see, this is more or less like a sound box. It has six main strings for playing, out of which four are for melody. And two are for rhythm and drone. And underneath these strings, there are all these strings which are tuned by these little yes. pegs. Are How many? Thirteen. And you, which hands, do you play them with your left hand? The, the, the strings underneath, do you play those at all, or are they just vibrating as you play the, yeah, the top strings? Yeah, they are known string? as sympathetic resonating strings. They vibrate, you see. So that gives a special, uh, and you get overtones also like this, for instance. 
And uh, what is very important, I have to use little oil to lubricate. You have to put this little uh, ring-like thing. A little a a plectrum, plectrum in a way, yeah. yes. Here on this finger. And uh, what is very interesting on sitar is that you can play on the frets and get the same notes sometimes by not playing on the frets, but pulling them sideways, as they say, bending the string. And that's what gives a very special effect of the board instrument or a vocal effect, like this, for instance. first time. Where do you start first with uh, this? Well, mode? that's the whole thing, you know. Ours is an oral tradition. It's not a written down music as in the West. But uh, the beginning uh, can be compared same as the Western classical because we have to do a lot of scale practices, you know, just the technique of it, like... Uh, <laughs> And these are simple things, you know, a lot of exercises and things like that. Each note is uh, has a name, like Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol. We call it Sa, Re, Ga, Ma, Pa, Dha, Ni, Sa. So, sol phase system, no? Sa, Re, Ga, Re, Sa, Re, Ga, Ma, Ga, Re, Sa, Re, Ga, Re, Sa, Re, Sa, Ga, Re, Ga, Sa, Re, Sa, Ma, Ga, Ma, Re, Ga, Re, Pa, Ma, Pa, Ga, Ma, Ga, Tha, Ba, Tha, Ga, Ma, Pa, Ma, Ga, Re, Sa, Ni, Sa, Re, Sa, Ni, Tha, Pa. So, this is how the Guru teaches us. By the voice, by not voice, by written music. Also ever. by, you know, demonstrating. But later on, it's no more, it is just vocalizing. And we have a language also, like the drums have a language, the tabla, you know, the accompanist, uh, they have a language for each sound. Same way we also have for each stroke, like this is da, this is ra. So when we are, uh, you know, we know exactly what the sounds are. The guru teaches us like da 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 but gradually I saw that it was very superficial and they were all <laughs> spaced out you know it was so much mixed with drugs and at, then came that period of you know whole the whole Indian religion Kama Sutra, Tantra, Yoga, Hash everything was all mixed up and that was a difficult period for me because you see my guru was very old fashioned and he taught me this music saying always that keep the integrity, keep the, you know, sanctity of our music. So, you know, I used to feel very unclean. Of course, throughout that time, you were still very great friends with a number of classical musicians of the West. Yehudi Menuhin was exactly. one. You've known That's for many years. That's the beauty years. of our music. It attracts all the different sectors. You know, jazz is another area. In fact, that was the first uh, area where uh, my music was a great success. All the jazz buffs, jazz musicians, you know, people like uh, John Coltrane, who became my student. Is that Many because of the of jazz musicians. Is that because in of the, the improvisation, initial, the, the interest in right. improvisation? Right. So that improvisation was the point which sort of many people thought is same like jazz, though it isn't. It is very superficially similar because jazz improvises on some chords and some, you know, harmony patterns 
they take up a theme and then they improvise, they do anything they want. But we improvise on ragas, we are more disciplined in it, to see, we have to keep the raga, sanctity of the raga and pattern of the raga. So it's more difficult, you see, in a way. But then, you see, I made wonderful friends with uh, Menuhin, who is such a great musician and a great human being. He has so much love for different sort of music, different uh, traditions. And uh, we did a few records which became very uh, like successful. What? I composed specially, based on Indian music, that Indian ragas and talas. Of course, eventually, you started writing not only for individual Western musicians, but for Western orchestras. Right. Now, how, how difficult is it? Because you don't have orchestras as, in the same way with Indian Imagine. music, do you? Well, the thing is this, that uh, I never tried to do something which was not in my jurisdiction, in the sense I tried to keep the basis of ragas and talas. And what I thought that the orchestra, the Western orchestra, has got such tremendous range. Uh, so many octaves you get, plus stone, colors, you know, the dynamics. I, I, I really try to use that much more and keep it as Indian as possible and not overdo with too much of harmony and counterpoint. Uh, and the result was to some very pleasing. I was quite satisfied with some some of it. Of course, some are maybe not that interesting, but I found it completely satisfying because uh, of what I said, the range. It was more of an extension to my sitar. I know one of your more recent efforts in, in that way was um, doing the music for the Gandhi film. And where you were nominated for an Academy Award, it, it worked so well. I could have done much more for that film, really, I'm sorry to say, but uh, whatever has been heard has been very much appreciated. I'm glad to see that. But there you were working with George Fenton, weren't you? The two of you were working together to try and combine the Western and the Indian feeling. Well, How that's well what it <laughs> seemed like, but that was not the point that I started with, you know. I really wanted to uh, bring more spirit of Gandhi and the simplicity in his life, you know. And uh, as I said, the net result it seems to be very good and people love it. But uh, there, there were many places where I felt there would have, should have been music of different sort or different type. But it's a matter of, you know, opinion, of course. with the, the long, long tradition of Indian classical music behind you, you have had to adapt so much in this last generation to the modern world, not only to traveling to the West, but um, the fact that you are actually putting music to films and have been doing so for years. I have been wrongly interpreted because I play two different roles, one as a performer, where I'm very orthodox, where I'm very traditional, you know, whatever I have learned from Baba and plus my own uh, thing in it, to it. But the foundation is really very deeply traditional. But the other role is like a composer. There I'm not frightened to experiment, you see. Whether it's opera, ballet, orchestra, or anything. I have tried hands with jazz, with electronic music. My last record is all completely with emulator, which is, you know, the latest thing. It is step forward than uh, the synthesizer where you feed each sound and then you can do whatever you want with it on the keyboard. And 
I feel very happy to have worked in this and it has turned out to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Of course, I haven't found anyone to bring it out yet. <laughs> but, you <laughs> know, I have come. tried everything uh, as a composer because from my childhood I've been very much interested in doing new things, experimenting. How do you see your future developing? Are you going to become more of a teacher? I know you have been doing teaching for many years, but is this going to become more important, do you think, in, in future years? Well, I like to spend really much more time in India and do a lot of creative things. Uh, I visualize, I have already started working on uh, different ballets or musical, I like to call them musical because it's a multimedia thing, you see, not just ballet, not just opera, or, but take up uh, mythological subjects and show them in, uh, with all the multimedia uh, help, but basically Indian. This is what I'm going to work on as much as I can, apart from teaching these few students that I said. And how do you feel now about the fact that millions of young people look up to you? To, to me? Yes. They see you as their huh? guru and their guide. In oh, a way. oh, I see. Well, I see that among the young people nowadays, uh, it is more genuine. As I said in the 60s and 70s, it was more artificial, you know, it was more of an escape. But now I think they are, like in the music, same way, in the spiritual path also, they seem to be a little more serious. But on the other hand, I personally feel that a young person should spend more time, as one of our great saints Vivekananda used to say, he used to get very angry when he saw young people trying to meditate and do home and all that. He said, go and play football, go and work, do exercise, do, do some active work, karma yoga, you know. Through work you will find work. And when the time will come, then you start meditating. So I do believe that, you know, I still feel that it could be uh, just an escapism if one leaves everything and starts meditating. That's not for everyone, excepting some of the freaks, I would call them freaks, who are really from, like Buddha was, like Ramakrishna was, that from very childhood they had a special, like Satya Sai Baba is, you know. But for average people, I think young people don't, A, don't need drugs, because Youth is the biggest, greatest stimulant, I think. Maybe elderly people need little tranquilizers or <laughs> little help to sleep or, you know, to relax. But young people have the built-in stimulant in, in them. They don't really need drugs or sit down to meditate that much, mm -hmm. but really study and play, do something solid, practice. Yes, you haven't needed anything like that because your sitar has been no, I never the, the spirit of your life, hasn't That's it? good. <laughs> <laughs> I never needed any uh, stimulus. I have loved beauty, I have loved women, I have loved anything beautiful, but uh, those have been inspirations to me, but uh, definitely not drugs or drinks. Mm. So, looking back over your life, what do you think within yourself has been your greatest achievement? Well, I've gone through so many different periods, you know. I have experienced life at its fullest. All the pleasures, all the pl pains. And now I have come to realize that uh, I have to be more introvert, you know, and bring out whatever I can do as a creative person. I cannot just close the door and sit in a room. As long as I have this creative urge, I'll try to, you know, bring out as much as I can through whatever inner disciplines or meditation or guidance from people that I love and respect. You'll speak to the world through your sitar. And through my sitar. Ravi Shankar, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>